All right, so we're going to cover 2D finite elements uh, for unsteady or steady heat transfer problem, meaning that I can tackle uh, transient problems with, uh, with uh, these kind of formulations, okay? Uh, what is the variable of interest in a heat transfer problem? Temperature. Very good. And so let's go back to the favorite chart of mine. Basically, what is finite elements? What, are, what we're trying to do? We're trying to use finite elements to approximate the solution to a partial differential equation. And to do that, we developed a, a, a process where it involves developing the PDE of the problem. Uh, formulating the general element behavior um, over a domain, discretized domain. Uh, we'll then, then take the domain and discretize into small pieces uh, and assemble the system together and solve a linear uh, algebraic system of equations, which can also be nonlinear. Um, in this disc discussion, what we're going to do is extend 1D to 2D. We're moving to 2D now, uh, and then 3D is basically very similar to 2D. So if I cover 2D, you'll basically learn what two, uh, 3D is about, OK? Uh, so what are the steps? Step one, we have to establish a strong form of the problem. We have to develop the partial differential equation uh, for the problem of interest. In a lot of our situations, the partial differential equation is known. You know the heat transfer equation. You know the moisture diffusion equation. Uh, you know the flow potential equation. You know the structural mechanics partial differential equations. And I can go on and on and on, right? But if you're doing research, maybe you'll come up with an equation that's unique to your situation. And the point I want to make in this course is that you can tackle that problem uh, in your area of expertise and, 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 and solve it. The second step in the process is to develop the weak form. So you'll start from the strong form that was provided, and you will then develop the weak form. And to develop the weak form, you will develop the residual function and that residual function, you will make it orthogonal uh, to the weight function uh, and integrate that uh, expression over the domain. And that will basically give you uh, this, the, the weighted residual. And now, when you integrate by parts, you'll integrate by parts to reduce the continuity requirements. And when you do that, uh, now you have developed the weak form of the problem. Okay. I will go then and, and take into step three. I'll take the domain of interest and I'll discretize it uh, into pieces, into subdomains, which I can now uh, develop an element formulation for, which is the next step. I'll develop the element for, for formulation and uh, I'll approximate the, the function, uh, which will have a known coefficients. And these unknown coefficients happen to be the nodal coefficients, the nodal unknowns. Uh, and so once I do that, I would also make sure that my approximation function is, is set up so that uh, the, the, the I satisfy the essential boundary conditions of the element, which in essence is continuity requirements across element boundaries. And so in that manner, I'm able to come up with the shape functions. These shape functions are your basis functions of the problem. And so I'll then substitute this approximation function into the weak form which I had developed, and I'll substitute the approximation function into the weak form, and then for the weight functions, I'll select each of the basis functions and make the error orthogonal to each of the basis functions. And so then I'll come up with a, the element formulation of stiffness and force vector in a heat conduction problem. It will be capacitance. It will change the, upon, upon the problem. So these, these meanings will change. Uh, then I'll assemble the global system matrix then I'll apply the boundary conditions. Some of them could be essential. Some of them will be natural. Then I'll solve the global system of equations for the nodal unknowns. And then I can use that data. If I know the temperatures, I know the heat flux. In, in the structural mechanics problems, if I know the displacements, I know the strains, I know the stresses, then I can determine whether the structure breaks or, or is OK or has good margins of safety. OK? Do you guys follow the steps in general? We, we repeated this over and over, but I think it's important that you understand these steps very well, these processes. This process is what we develop and, uh, and, and apply to 1D problem, and today we'll be looking at 2D problems. In a heat transfer problem, to remind you, we covered this in lecture four. Uh, in a heat transfer problem, we're looking at uh, the energy balance 
of internal heat generation and heat uh, out from the surfaces. Uh, so this surface here may have some heat applied or may have some heat extracted through that surface. And then on this boundary, maybe we have a temperature that is specified. Potentially, you could have that situation. Um, we also found that heat across the surface, if I have uh, heat going out that surface, that the amount of heat really going out is Q dot N. So that's QN right there. And we found an expression for 2D or 3D. We can do it either way, uh, depending upon the problem of, problem of interest. It could be 3D or 2D. Um, for a diagonal uh, orthotropic uh, and a constant conductivity matrix, um, not specially dependent, uh, basically the conductivity is constant across the structure of interest. Uh, in the 3D version, we found that the energy balance led us to the partial differential equations uh, for a heat transfer problem. Uh, T specified on part of the boundary, and then Q, the heat flux specified on part of the boundary. You know, so in essence, you're, you have to solve this partial differential equation, uh, and there can be many different applications where, you know, the temperature specified or you have heat applied to the part. Okay. Um, we also found that QN can be related to the conductivity matrix D bold. D bold is this one right here. Uh, we covered that. D bold times the gradient of the temperature field uh, is. Uh, the, the Q, Q, bold Q, across a surface, but dotted with N gives you the heat flux uh, normal to that surface. And so, so that's what we had discussed in lecture four. Uh, now, if I wanted to expand this equation so there's more, more clear what we're talking about, uh, rather than matrix notation, uh, the gradient here, by definition, the gradient definition is basically this one. The derivative of uh, re respect to X, derivative of respect to Y, derivative with respect to z. But since I have gradient transpose, uh, <clears throat> what I have is, is, is that, that column vector becoming a, a uh, this, this vector right here, 1 by 3. Okay? And so then I multiply by that by d bold, which is this expression here, d bold. Um, and then I have the gradient of t, which is that. And I can expand that. I'll multiply all of this. And then, and then I'll get the expression on the bottom. So that's a partial differential equation for a 3D problem. And then if I look at what it looks like for a 2D problem, in essence, it's, it's very similar. But now everything is in, 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 in as a, a unit thickness, you know, per unit thickness, or if you know the thickness, um, basically constant thickness uh, on that plate. Okay, so I, I can actually tackle that problem very well. Uh, in this case, now it's a 2D problem. Uh, and uh, your partial differential equation simplifies to, to this right here. Okay. Any questions so far? This was covered extensively in lecture four. I encourage you to go back and, and kind of review that uh, lecture. And then if you still have questions on how we derive this equation, I invite you to, to just ask those questions. So, small is the natural boundary condition? So, so Q right here, this Q applied here uh, is your natural boundary condition. And it's, just, it's right here, natural boundary condition. And then the temperature specified on this boundary is essential boundary condition. What is temporal Q? Q is the internal heat generation, the internal heat uh, that this uh, part is, is may see. Okay? So that you have to have energy balance in the system. The, the heat input has to be equal to the heat output. And so that's how we had derived those equations using energy balance. Uh, so, so we can now go ahead and, 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 and develop the weak form of the problem because what we end up, we really want to do is to derive an approximate solution to the problem, to this, to this 2D heat transfer problem. And to, to do that, we need to come up with the, the weak form of the problem. Uh, to do that, uh, I'm going to use, uh, by the way, uh, earlier I had gradient transpose. Uh, you can replace gradient transpose by gradient dot. That's the same thing. Uh, and if you, for example, took two vectors, uh, and I want to find the dot product of the two, I'll have A dot B, right? But the, another way to write it is A transpose B, and that will give you a scalar quantity as well. So I'm just switching conventions to dot for, for a couple of minutes. I may go back to transpose. I'm doing it on purpose so to show you that they're inter interchangeable, okay? Because in some books, you may see this gradient 
as divergence of d gradient t. You may say it that way. You may say it as gradient dot this. You may say gradient transpose d gradient t. So I'm showing you all the different versions. So you, you when you read books and you, you, know, you look at the literature, you understand that all these things are equivalent. Is that clear? Uh, so uh, I actually added, since we covered dynamics and we covered transient, I thought, well, we'll just keep that term. That, just make it unsteady. Just add that term uh, because now we can talk about it. You guys know how to deal with it. Uh, in fact, I can give you a 3D, a 2D problem, transient. But you know what's going to happen? At the end of everything, when you do everything, all the steps, at the end, you're going to end up with the same thing you have in the 1D problem. You're going to have a matrix times a temperature column of unknowns. And all you have to do is just the same steps. At that point, it's the same steps. Okay? So there's no difference between 3D, 2D, and 1D once I get to the discreditation of the problem. Once I'm at the very end, where I need to start applying uh, uh, either new mark in, in structural mechanics or central difference of backward or forward difference in uh, transient problems, OK? Um, and so with that said, uh, what I will do, I'll take this equation and call it the residual uh, error. And I'll make this error, and I'll make it orthogonal to the weight function v. And I'll integrate it over the domain. In this case, um, v is my weight function. h is the plate thickness. So I'm choosing h to be plate thickness. You agree with me that the volume can be represented as plate thickness times dA. dA is the planar differential area of the part. And so now all I have to do is to multiply V across every single component here of, of that equation. And I have to now integrate by parts. To integr integrate by parts, um, we're only going to integrate by parts this term here because uh, T right now has second order differentiation. Remember, I have gradient of a gradient, so that's going to give me second order differentiation on T. So I want to split that order of differentiation with V, share some of der that derivative over to V so that uh, I can lower the continuity requirements um, um, so I can now develop the weak form as well. So to do that, I'll, set, I'll just work on this term. This term doesn't need to be worked on because uh, this term is a time derivative on temperature. We're not doing anything with that until much later when we're ready to do central difference, forward difference, or backward difference uh, to discretize the time domain using a finite difference approach. Temperature domain, uh, time domain, sorry, time domain is what we're discretizing using finite difference. Uh, the spatial domain we're discretizing using finite elements. And so now I'm ready to write V on the left-hand side. I'm ready to write this expression right here on the right-hand side. And to integrate by parts a 2D domain, uh, you'll remove the gradient, put it on the other side. And then you're left with D bold gradient temperature. And now you have this N here. The reason why you have that N, let's talk about that. When you're doing 1D problems, uh, we didn't write an N. Uh, there's a reason for that. Now, 1D problem, the endpoints are the boundary conditions. Is that true? So it's not true normal, right? It's just endpoints. Uh, in a 2D problem, what is the boundary condition in a 2D problem? What is that described by? Just listen very carefully to the word boundary. When I talk about a 2D plate, what is the boundary of that 2D plate? The curve surrounding that plate. Is that true? For a 3D body, what do you expect that it's a surface that's enclosing that, but that's your boundary, right? And so this term right here that we were talking about, this cross term here, that's your boundary term. When you integrate by, part, when you integrate by parts, you have a term that's a boundary term and a term that's, that's basically your volume part, your, your volume integral. In this case, uh, I need to describe where I am in that curve right, in that 2D curve. And because I need to describe where I am, I need the N, N bold. I need to know what the normal to that surface looks like at every point around the domain. Is that clear? Yes? And so, so when I write my weak form 
I'll bring this into back into my weak form. I'll multiply this by that, bring it back to the my weak form, and this times that goes to my boundary. And so let's look at what I've done. I, I have minus nu q, uh, sorry, minus v q there, uh, plus v rho c d t dot there. And then what I've done is I've brought this term back in here, which is the one here, this times that. And you can notice here I put the dot back there. So keep the dot. There's uh, another way to write it is gradient v transpose, but no dot. And then, well, that would be the ways you can do it. Uh, and then that's, that's, that's the one that goes back into the area integral. And then now I have to tackle the boundary condition. The boundary condition is basically the surface that's enclosing that boundary, right? Sorry, the surface enclosed. The boundary is the surface or the line integral enclosing the body we're talking about, the 2D body we're talking about. And so when I multiply this by that, that goes in there into my boundary term minus v times d bold gradient of t dot n. Okay? So I'm taking this dot n with n, and then that will give me the component uh, times v. Okay? H is a plate thickness. S is the differential uh, line element around, going around that surface. Okay? Any questions on that? You follow? Okay. So if I give you a different problem, you can tackle it, right? Is that true? Okay. All right. So, um, so let's let's look at the weak form uh, for two D. So, uh, what I've done here, I have rewritten the expression uh, here that I had before, uh, but I have added, I, I have also, I have broken the boundary term into two terms, right? So if we go back, this boundary term here at the bottom right. Uh, comprises the whole boundary. Is that true? The whole thing. But I can, don't you agree I can break up the boundary into two parts? One that's where I apply the essential boundary conditions, and the other part that's where I apply the natural boundary conditions. Can I do that? Can I break up an integral that way? Yeah, I, I can break up an integral into two. And so that's what I've done. I've broken up the integral into the line integral where the temperature is specified, and I've broken it into the line integral where the, the natural boundary condition, the heat flux, is specified. I want you to notice that this is what we called QN earlier. That's QN right there. That's what we had defined uh, in, in lecture four, and I also brought that to your attention uh, today. Uh, QN is just that term. So I can make a substitution. If I know QN at the boundary, and uh, uh, sorry, just went ahead of myself, uh, this here will be Qn. I can put it in there. It's specified Q bar because I'm specifying the natural boundary condition on that that part of the surface. Um, and on this guy, uh, that's where I apply the temperature, the boundary condition, specify them at the boundary. Okay. So if I have a square plate and I want to say the temperature at this edge stays at 50 degrees, well, that's your essential boundary condition. That edge is your um, essential boundary condition. How do I know what the essential boundary condition is? You guys are an expert at that now, and you know that what I need to do is focus on this V and make that V uh, switch it to the variable of interest. In this case, it's temperature. So I know anything specified on the temperature is, in fact, an essential boundary condition. Anything else will become a, a, a natural boundary condition. Okay? Um, but you also know uh, that if I specify the temperatures on this edge or on that on that part of that line integral that this is going to vanish it's going to go away anyway later because i need to enforce the essential boundary conditions i have to enforce them and because i have to enforce them uh, and my weight functions will become my basis functions remember the basis functions have to satisfy all the essential boundary conditions remember that the homogeneous form, they're going to have to be zero at the locations where essential boundary conditions are specified. So if you go back to the 1D problems that we did, weak form galeric for those, the basis function vanishes at the locations where essential boundary conditions are specified. Is that true? Yes? yes. Is everybody with me? Yeah? Since I'm selecting D later on to be my basis functions, and this, in fact, represents the essential boundary conditions, the part where you specify them. 
then this will vanish. It will go away. And so what I get here is actually the weak form of the problem. Okay? This is, this is the weak form of the problem. Do you guys have any questions whatsoever before I continue to the next step? This is only step two. We just developed the weak form. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain it. So, so we talked about, remember that when we use the weak form Galerkin later on, that in weak form Galerkin, the weight function is selected as the basis function. Is that true? Yes? We cover that. Uh, so the weight function is selected as the basis function. And recall that the basis functions have to be zero at locations where essential binary conditions are specified. That was a, a, a requirement in weak form Galerkin. Okay. Because of that, because the basis functions have to be zero at locations where uh, the primary variable of interest is specified, then it follows that this term must go to zero because there's no way. I mean, it cannot be other than zero. Okay. Yes? Okay. Um, all right, so we are now ready to apply finite elements to this problem, okay? Because I have the weak form, okay? Uh, the weak form for a 3D problem is the same as a 2D, except now instead of having a plate thickness times dA, I'm gonna have a dV, 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 and then these boundary terms will become an area uh, where I can apply the temperature, where I can apply, um, the, 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 I can specify the heat flux. Uh, this will also vanish in the 3D version. So what are the admissibility requirements on the temperature? What, what are those requirements um, for us to be admissible here? So for the temperature T to be admissible, uh, the gradient, when I calculate the gradient, it must be a finite number, right? I should not have a value that blows up in value. Uh, also, I don't want to have a value that gives me zero. I want to be able to calculate the gradient. Um, we also need to make sure that our essential boundary conditions are satisfied. Uh, and to do that, we need to make sure, in our case, that the temperatures from element to another element, they're, they're, they can, um, that the temperatures are continuous across element boundaries. That was a, it is a requirement for us in this case, okay? Uh, just like what we covered in the 1D cases, okay? Um, so, so with that said, now I have the weak form, and my goal is to now that I have the weak form is to discretize the domain, and I can do it many different ways. I can discretize it using triangular elements. Uh, here you can see an example of a mesh with triangular elements. Okay, so these are all triangular elements. Do you notice here that all these triangles look different in shape, and uh, they are, you know, basically distributed in, in a different sizes and, and some of them are smaller sizes, okay? Uh, there are algorithms that we can teach here in this course about how to gen write a mesh generator, but I don't think it's important given that the codes do that for you. So I don't wanna spend too much time on that, but if you're interested, I can point you to some resources in case you're doing research and you, want, you wanna basically generate your own mesh. Uh, I, I believe that you can now generate mesh with the codes that are available. Uh, so you don't have to write those codes. But if, if you really need to do that for your research, I can give you some pointers on how to do that. And some of the ways to generate the mesh um, auto automatically uh, rely on concepts uh, based on Delaunay, Delaunay triangulation. I may be pronouncing the first word incorrectly, but they're using Delaunay triangulation to, to basically generate this mesh automatically. Um, there's, there's other techniques uh, that can be used. Uh, in, in, in another example will be somewhat like a half uh, symmetry of a wrench looking uh, structure and here you have triangular elements. What you notice here I have uh, linear triangular elements here and I don't know if you see these edges but they're curved. So I can actually have triangular elements that have curved edges, okay? Uh, so maybe I wanna represent this curve better, okay? So maybe I wanna use triangular elements with second order uh, interpolation. I'll get to that at some point. So I can now better represent the fillet radius, or maybe it's a fillet radius in your application, or a circle. Uh, I can better represent that stress concentration. Uh, 
Here you see examples of triangles used everywhere, uh, but just three examples here. And the goal is that I've, I want to discretize this uh, domain uh, using 2D elements, triangle, triangles or quadrilaterals. And so for that, I'll have to solve this weak formula lurking uh, for over that triangle and over that quadrilateral. Okay? So that's my goal, because if I can break up the, the domain into smaller domains that are much easier to work with, then I have a very good chance to then assembling the system together later on and just tackling the bigger problem. You follow what we're doing in this course? So we're trying to tackle the small problem first before we tackle the big one. That's really what we're doing. Okay. So uh, to do that, and now I'll, I'll warn you, tackling a triangular element and a quadrilateral element is, is not that straightforward, but we'll cover that here. Okay, so, so uh, let's talk about what approximation functions we can select. So I can select the approximation function that ends here, right? I, I could have just stopped there. Is that true? Just take a temperature and just stop here? Just use a one-term approximation? Can I do that? Sorry? Zero one. So if I take the gradient of the temperature, I get zero? Yeah, I have a constant value. Can I do that? No, the weak form is going to give me zero. I mean, I, I won't have anything to calculate. The, this weak form right here, the gradient of a constant value gives me zero. That's not going to work, right? Now, another uh, thing I could do is stop here. But if I stop there, I have a problem because I'm biasing the solution only in the x direction, and the solution should be able to manage the x and the y. You agree? So at the very least, what I should be able to do is stop right here. And for a linear, if I use a linear triangular element, just a triangular element with three nodes, one at each corner, right? How many unknown nodal quantities I have? Three. It's temperature. The only unknown is temperature at each node, right? And there's three nodes. So for that reason, how many unknown coefficients should I, should I select for my temperature field? Three. So if I have three unknowns, three unknown nodal quantities, I should have three unknown coefficients, right? Yes? And so that's why I stopped here. Because I need three unknown coefficients to tackle the problem. However, uh, using, I could use this approximation function and plug it into weak form, but that's not very convenient because these unknown coefficients in weak form glurking have no physical meaning, right? So what if we write these unknown coefficients in terms of um, the nodal unknown quantities? You follow me? That's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to relate these unknown coefficients to unknown quantities at the nodes because they have more meaning there. Okay? Not only that, I'm basically, by doing that, implicitly what I'm doing is actually I'm enforcing the fact that that temperature field is continuous across element boundaries. I'm basically doing that by, by, by making that happen. Okay? Um, and so uh, in, a, in a 3D, if I go to a 3D domain, uh, <clears throat> in a 3D, uh, the simplest element you can have is a linear tetrahedron, four-noted tetrahedron. Uh, so, you know, in 3D, uh, I think you can picture a tetrahedron, hopefully. Okay, each face looks like a triangle, and then you have four nodes, four vertices they call them, and at each, at each vertex you will have an unknown quantity, a nodal unknown. In this case, you have four, uh, four unknown coefficients, uh, and now you have x, y, and z. You have to have z also now because it's 3D, right? Uh, but instead of tackling the 3D problem, I'll keep tackling the 2D because it, 3D is an extension of of, uh, of 2D. Okay, so if we follow, if we follow uh, the 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 problem in in uh, 2D, you will follow how to do it in 3D. It, it follows, okay? Uh, so we covered. What are the requirements for conversions for a the approximation function we're selecting? Okay. So normally in weak form lurking, you'll have gone in, created your basis functions, 
to make sure this basis function satisfies the essential boundary conditions. You have gone in and inserted that into the weak form Galerkin, turned the crank, and solved for the known coefficients, the C's. But again, there's no physical meaning to this C's, and it's very difficult to construct and assemble the global system together. So for that reason, what we're going to do is um, look at things in terms of interpolation functions. In 2D, what I'm hoping that we can do is that the unknown coefficients now in 2D are these T1, T2, T3. So these temperatures at these nodes are the unknowns of the problem. While the shape functions now will become these shape, these basis functions, okay? And by doing so now, I'm able to represent the behavior temperature uh, in that element, okay? For 3D, uh, actually I drew the trees right here for you. Uh, in the back side, I have a dashed line to represent basically a face here, a face there, a face in the back, and then a face in the back on the bottom. Uh, but again, now you have four nodes, so you have four temperatures uh, that are unknown, and the basis functions uh, are the ones that you will have to find to, to basically plug in now into your weak form, right? Because once I have my pressure image, once I have ends, these ends, Am I ready to go into the weak form? Yeah, I'm ready to go. What we're doing now is coming up with approximation function. The first half of this class, it was, it was kind of unclear. I'll give you a problem and I'll tell you to come up with approximation function. It was not very systematic. I don't know if you remember. You had to come up, come, up, come up with a guess, a good guess on how the approximation function is going to look like. Now, ever since we tackle fine elements, the approximation functions, the way you, you come up with them, it's kind of systematic. There's, there's an approach to them on how to do this, okay? Um, but I don't want you to lose sight that what we're really doing is coming up with approximation function to the problem. Now, how do we find these ends? So how do I find these ends is basically relating these unknown coefficients here. So I have these unknown coefficients. I want to be able to relate them to the nodal quantities. That's really what I want to do. So to do that, for a 2D triangle, and, and it's very important to keep in mind the convention here. Uh, in 1D, we didn't have to deal with that. But uh, in 2D, it's very important. So uh, here you see uh, counterclockwise. It's important to, to understand that you want to have the nodes numbered uh, counterclockwise because you want to have a positive area uh, for that element. It's going to come up more important later as I discuss it. But if you go the opposite direction, then you're going to have a negative area. Even Abacus, Abacus is going to tell you that. It's going to say, hey, you have negative area. You can't do this. You have to rever reverse your um, uh, connectivity so that it's correct. So it's going from counterclockwise. Okay? It doesn't matter how you number. You can start here, one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, like I have it here. The important thing is that it's counterclockwise. Okay? And that becomes also important in your assembly of the system. So it's important to keep the assembly of the system uh, in the same way, counterclockwise. Okay? So construct your connectivity very carefully when you do that. Uh, so, but this is, guys and, and ladies, this is what we want, we want to do. We want to be able to, to come up with these shape functions. That's, that's my goal, the basis functions. Uh, and those are going to be known functions. Okay? We can find them. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to set T1 to be Tx1 at y1, T2 set at x2, y2, and then T3 eval evaluate this temperature function at x3, y3. So I'll take that temperature function at first assume. Remember, I assumed that one early on. Yes? yes. So I plug in the value of x1 and y. Remember, these are numbers. These are not variables. You know where the triangle is. You know where the triangle is in the system. So you know what x1 and y1 is. You know what x2, y2 is. You know what x3, y3 is. You know all of that. So there's no reason to be concerned when you see a lot of variables showing up. Okay? So I'll plug in x1 and y1. And when I do that, I get an equation there. There's a plus bx1 plus cy1. And I realize that that's actually equal to t1, the value of t1. Uh, and then the nodal value. Uh, at the temperature value at node 1. And then I plug in the value for x2 and y2, and I get the nodal value uh, for temperature at node 2. And then I plug in x3 and y3, and I get the nodal temperature at node 3. 
Okay. So now I have three equations, three unknowns, right? Is that true? I can solve for A, B, and C in terms of T1, T2, and T3. That's my goal. I want to be able to find what A, B, and A, B, C looks like in terms of T1, T2, T3. And you can put that in matrix notation in this format. Again, X1, Y1, all these numbers are known for your problem. Now, the reason I'm not using numbers here is because me putting a number is not going to help you. We need to have a general element that any coordinate system I plug in works. You agree? So me putting numbers for an example doesn't work. But just imagine that these are all numbers. And you know them for every element. So now I can invert this, right, to find A, B, and C, a, B, and C yes? OK. Once I do that, I can solve for A, B, and C. So I have to invert this matrix that's, on no, that's known. This is fully known. I'll invert that times T1, T2, T3. So that's what I get. Fully known. I'll call this C bold here. So I get C inverse times that. Okay. To get my interpolation function, I showed you many different ways of doing it. I showed you Mathematica, how I do it in Mathematica. I'm going to show you a new way of doing it. Is, is going to give you the same answer. Okay. So what do you do is uh, you agree that temperature at any point inside the triangle is A plus BX plus CY. You agree? Yeah? You agree that this is also equal to 1XY ABC? Yeah? Very good. So what if I plug in ABC as C bold inverse T1, T2, T3 directly? I just plug that for that. So if I plug that in, now, when I multiply 1xy to c inverse, what I actually get right there, remember, these are 1 by 3 matrix, right? 1 by 3. What is the size of this one? 3 by 3, right? So what I get there? 1 by 3. So I'll get something here times t1, t2, t3. What are you going what, what to get there, right here? Is your shape functions, n1, n2, and n3. OK? You'll get it right away, directly, just by doing the operation. So I've shown you maybe four or five different ways on how to derive the shape functions. And hopefully, and I'll show you how to do it for triangular elements later on for a different kind, uh, so you can see how quickly we can get to it in a different way. Okay. Uh, any questions on what I just did here? Now, what I'm going to show you next is how these shape functions look like. And they're not pretty. I'll show you what they look like. And I don't know how I will, have to, I will have derived this by hand without doing these operations, just to be clear. So this is what you get for shape functions, OK? Uh, N1, N2, and N3. So when you do this operation, when you do this multiplication right here, uh, what you get uh, is N1, N2, and N3. Now, this looks very messy, and I agree it is messy. Um, so let's start with uh, what A is. A here is the area of the triangle, in essence, and which can be determined as one half the, determ the determinant of C bold. So uh, here we have C bold. Remember that? We've talked about that one. So if you take the determinant of C bold, you get times one half, you get the area of the triangle. That's the area of the triangle. Um, now, remember, it needs to be complicated because a triangle, getting the area of a triangle is not that easy if you know the coordinates. You have to do some work, right? Um, and so then I have that there. And then I have all these numbers are known. I know all this. You know the coordinates of node 2 and 3. So you know all this. You know all this. You know all this, OK? Um, and so n1 is a function of x and y. You can see that here very clearly. n2 is just a function of x and y also. And then n3 is just a function of x and y. Everything else is numbers. Everybody understands that, yeah? Now, it's important to understand that I have to do this for every triangle in the system. I have to calculate the shape functions for every triangle. OK, so for every triangle here, do you agree that every triangle looks different? Yeah? Do you agree the area of every triangle looks almost different? Do you agree that the coordinates of the, every single triangle also is different? That's for sure different. You don't have two triangles coincident here. So you're going to have to derive the shape functions for every single triangle. 
for every single one of them, okay? And uh, it's not pretty, as you see here, okay? But uh, good news, although it doesn't look pretty, there are some good properties that still it still complies with. Uh, the first one is the Kronecker delta property. So if I took uh, and I looked at N1, shape function one, it is going to, if I plug in here x1 and y1 right there, I will get one. So I'll get one for N1 at that node, and then zero at the other two nodes. So that's how the shape function looks like in 3D, okay? So while the shape functions look complicated, we can actually show how they look by plotting them, okay? Chef function two, for example, takes a value of one at x2, y2, but then right here is a height one, but then it's zero at the other two nodes. And then the same for shape function three. So it satisfies the Kronecker delta property. Do you know the other one that satisfies? Partition unity, thank you. So if I add up, and perhaps this is a good extra credit, 10 points, if you add up N1 plus N2 plus N3, you add them up, guess what you're going to get? One. You're going to get one. It's not, it's not obvious that you're going to get one, but you're going to get one when you do it by hand. Okay? So uh, here it is. So when I do Kronecker delta, uh, when I do partition unity, unity check, and I add all these three, I will get one. I guarantee you that. It doesn't look like it will be, but it's going to be. And what's going to happen is you're going to get an uh, area. Uh, basically, when you add this, these uh, coefficients, you're going to get an area. And the area is going to cancel. You can, you can get a full one there. Okay. Um, then the next step here is to kind of understand other properties that come along with these triangles. So, so you have a good understanding of what's going on. So let's see here. If, if do you agree that a temperature field can be represented as T1 times N1 plus T2 times N2 plus T3 times N3? Yeah, that's what we talked about. That's my approximation function. By the way, I just found my basis functions. These N1, N2, and N3 are your basis functions in weak form Galerkin. I just found them. Okay. And I also know they satisfy the essential boundary conditions for that element because of the Kronecker delta property. Okay. N1 is one and is zero at the other nodes, that automatically tells me the temperature must be T1 at that node, one, okay? And the same for node two and node three. If I look at the temperature field in general, I should, do you agree that this is T0, 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 I must be able to represent a temperature somewhere in the middle that's T0. So this 50 degrees, that's 50 degrees, that's 50 degrees, I can't have 60 degrees in the middle, right? I need to have 50 degrees. So to, to do, see if, let's see what happens. So when I put it in here, if I make it all the T's, T1, T2, and T3 equal to T0, you agree that T0 factors out, and now I'm left with T, this must be equal to T0? Isn't that meaning that the shape functions must all add to one, yeah? So all the shape functions must add to, add to one. So this property here, the partition unity, what, it, what that's doing for us is allowing us to represent a constant temperature on the element. It's allowing us to represent that behavior, okay? In solid mechanics, you'll be representing a rigid body motion. You can move, for example, in a solid mechanics problem, if this move to the right U one inch, this move to the right one inch, this move to the right one inch. Uh, by this partition, partition unity proper property, what we're showing is that uh, we can represent rigid body motion of that, one, of that triangle moving to the right one inch, okay? In a heat conduction problem, heat problem, heat transfer problem, what we're saying is that we can represent the constant temperature state, okay, with partition unity. Is that clear? Excellent. So now let's look at another, another property. It's called uh, conforming interpolation. And what we're saying here is that the temperature must be, must be um, uh, basically continuous across element boundaries. So if I have an element here and I have an element here, uh, the Kronecker delta property in the assembly process ensures that the temperature here 
for NMN1 and the temperature here for NMN2, that they are equal to each other at this node and that node. Okay? And so we are showing that by satisfying these essential boundary conditions uh, in the way we derive those shape functions. There's a question there. So the question is, how do I handle a situation where one material is at different temperatures from other material? You can, but at that boundary, most likely the temperatures, the temperatures have to be continuous across that boundary. So you can start with a temperature here for this material one, start with a temperature here at material two, and when they coincide in the middle, somewhere in the middle where they meet, these two materials meet, the temperature must be continuous across NMN boundaries, okay? Kind of like in a solid mechanics problem. If I have material one here, material two here, and they're glued together, if I apply a displacement here and I apply a displacement here, I cross the NMN boundary, I hope the displacements are continuous because otherwise you're modeling fracturing of two parts. They have to be continuous across NMN boundaries. Let me take that question at the end. Okay, don't, I'll, I'll tackle it, but uh, let me continue here, okay? Uh, so don't, don't forget it to ask me at the end. Um, okay, any questions on this? Okay, again, we're still talking about approximation functions here. I'm just trying to show you some properties. Don't, don't forget what we've done. We started talking about the partial differential equation. We developed the weak form, and then now we're applying weak form galerking and before we apply weak form galerking, we need to come up with a suitable approximation function for temperature. And the suitable approximation for temperature is not being made as unknown coefficients that have no physical meaning. We're making them so they have physical meaning. And now my basis function turn out to have actually meaning as well. And there are the shape functions. And these shape functions now have additional properties, which is Kronecker delta property, partition unity, conforming interpolation, meaning that they, uh, it allows you to represent uh, temperatures that continues across element boundaries. And then we've now also showed you that the choice of shape functions uh, allows you to represent a constant temperature state in the element. Is that clear? Excellent. So, so my next step is to look at the approximation function, which was selected to be of this form. Uh, we selected the temperature to be equal to A plus BX plus CX. Um, and I want to show you that the temperature field can be represented by a constant value, as shown here, A plus this term. You agree that the gradient of this term will give me constant value? Right? So. It not only the choice approximation function allows you to represent a constant temperature state, allows you to also represent the gradient of temperature as well. Okay. So in the weak form, I want you to point out two things. In the weak form, we need to calculate the gradient of the temperature. That needs to be done. And so that will give you a constant value for a triangle. you agree? I mean, for this triangular element, this is going to give me a constant, bunch of constants. That's, isn't that true? I mean, there's no choice. That's what that's telling me. Um, so you will have those constants there. Okay. Uh, this simplest element that we've chosen um, allows us to represent a constant temperature state, but also a constant temperature gradient. Okay. Together, these two requirements constitute the uh, convergence and completeness requirements for this element. So this triangular element. I've shown you basically I can represent constant temperature states and I can represent a constant gradient. These two things together, the fact that I can do that in, for the most simplest element, uh, I, I'm now able to now make sure that we have uh, the completeness requirements met. Okay? I covered this already with 1D, but I'm showing you how this looks like for 2D. Okay? So if the gradient is not constant, what we're saying here is that I, I, I'm able to represent these two. I need to be able to represent these two in order to have completeness requirements at a minimum. I can have more terms. That's great. I, I can have this 
higher order terms. But if I don't include these terms, I'm going to be in trouble. I need to include those two terms at a minimum. I can have more terms, of course. I can have a second order triangular element, a cubic order triangular element, although I think Abacus stops a second order triangular element. Um, continuing on, um, completeness uh, plus conformity uh, uh, basically implies convergence. Uh, mesh refinement, uh, basically if I refine the mesh, I will converge to a, a better approximation to the solution. So the fact that I've chosen these approximation functions allows me to make that statement, allows me to tell me that when I refine the mesh more and more and more, I will be able to approach the solution to the problem, okay? And that's due to the choice of approximation functions that we had. But say for a second, say for a second, I did not include the first coefficient a, and I did not include bx plus cy. I have a problem. Because even if I, I can continue refining the mesh more and more and more and more, but because I can't represent even the simplest behavior of that domain, I won't be able to get a converged solution. I'm going to get something else that doesn't have any meaning. Does that make sense? I mean, think about it. If I assume, if I truncate all the stuff that has constant plus a gradient terms, so if I, if I ignore um, all these terms and I start, I just start from the get-go, plus bx squared plus cy squared plus bxy. And right now, for whatever reason, this plate wants to behave with constant temperature, I may, may not be able to represent that, okay? I can increase the mesh density 20 times, nothing's gonna change. You're gonna continue having a problem here, okay? So, um, <clears throat> it's important for us to understand that at a minimum, we need to have, at a minimum, these terms uh, for the weak form, and then the additional terms become bonus terms. I call them bonus because they make the solution look better, okay? They're great to have them, you don't have to have them. But if you have them, the solution is going to converge even faster. Okay. Um, so, hey, let's tackle how to work with the 2D finite element formulation now. Because now I'm ready. Don't you agree that what we need to do is to find the weak form, and then I find the approximation function, and then now I plug it back into the weak form? That's the next step. But now we're going to look at it from the element, just a single element. So we're going to look at the weak form for a single element, and I've chosen a triangle for now, but it could be a, a rectangle, quadrilateral, okay? That's why I made it generic. I made it in bold so I can plug in whatever I want, you know? So I could have uh, other types of elements, right? It doesn't have to be a triangular element. Uh, so what, it, what are my next steps? So my next step is plug in my approximation function into the weak form. That was the step. And for the weight function, what do I select? For the weight function, what do I select in turn? The, sh the basis function. So for, so I plug in the approximation function, and then for each weight function, sorry, for the weight function, I select each of the basis functions. And in our case, what are the basis functions? The shape functions, okay? When I do that, uh, we'll go ahead and, and show you, first of all, that I need to calcul calculate these gradients, and for that reason, I need to get ready for that. Remember, that's how I look at it. I want to get ready for what needs to be done. Uh, and I realize here that I have temperature equals in bold times temperature bold. Do you agree? So I'm basically putting all my shape functions here, and that these are the nodal unknown quantities. In our case, in bold for the triangular case is N1, N2, and N3, right? And then T bold is a column of T1, T2, and T3. Okay. Um, and now I have to calculate T dot because I, I want to be able to do on, unsteady heat transfer. I can do that too. Uh, again, uh, N bold is not a function of, of temp time. You know. So then in that case, T dot is N bold times T dot because the temperature is a function of time. Um, and from now on, I will not carry this as a function of time because uh, we're going to imply that that's true. So I don't keep carrying this over. So I'll plug in these approximation functions, and then for V, I'm going to select n bold transpose. Okay, that's my my 
these are the basis functions, okay, the shape functions. I'll select them as my weight functions. And when I do that, and I'm ready to plug it in, for V, I put N bold transpose right there. For D bold, I have that. For the gradient of temperature, for temperature, I have N bold uh, times temperature. So that's that, N bold. And I put the temperature bold outside of the integral because it's not a function of the integral, okay? I'll carry this H thickness and DA is a differential area, okay? Plus, now I have this term. This is my uh, time dependent term. Uh, nothing really special here. V is N bold transpose. And then T dot is just basically N bold T dot trans, T dot, I'm sorry. Uh, that's what you see here in bold T dot. Then I have the, the internal heat generation term for V N bold transpose. And then my boundary term where I may apply some heat flux. Uh, the V becomes N bold transpose Q bar, which is, means I'm specifying the heat flux at that boundary. Um, any questions on this? Fairly straightforward. Where? For what? So for this one, this term, there's no dot here. So it's only gradient of T, right? The only term, so let's go back to the partial differential equation. The partial differential equation, you only have a dot in this term. This term doesn't have a dot because it's not a time derivative. It's not the root of t respect to time. Oh, the, this dot. You're talking about this dot. Yeah. So, um, thank you for uh, re-asking the question. Okay. To, to answer that question, I don't have to put a dot. Uh, if I put the dot, then I remove the transpose. Remember, if I put transpose, then I remove... If I put transpose, don't put the dot. If you put the dot, don't put the transpose, okay? Uh, you can also check it that this matrix is of the correct size. Let's do that experiment really quick. But let's do the experiment because maybe others have the question. For a triangular element, for a triangular element, gradient of T, actually it's more, more complex than that. I'll do it later, okay? It's, let me show you what gradient of T looks like first before I tackle the size of these matrices, okay? But do you have any questions on this so far? You know, one, th one way I always uh, self-check myself is using the size of the matrices. If the size of the matrices are not multiplying with each other correctly, you know you have a problem with the transpose. So that's the way I check my work, okay? Um, you have any questions on this, on, on how we came about to this equation here at the bottom, okay? Okay, that, that is the element formulation. That is the element formulation. And um, continuing on for triangular element, for triangular element, I had to calculate the gradient of n. Remember that? We, we just talked about it. So we need to calculate that guy. And so that's basically the gradient by definition is derivative of uh, respect to x, derivative of respect to y, and then the n ball is n1, n2, and n3, correct? So then the gradient uh, of n is basically multiplying a two by one, a two by one vector times a one by three vector. So how much should I get there? What size? Two by three, I should get a two by three. So I have a gradient of that times a gradient of that times a gradient of that. Then the second row is gradient of that, gradient of that, gradient of that. And that's what you see here, and there's a two by three, okay? Two by three. Uh, do I know these ends? Yeah? Let me remind you that we know this end. So these are the ends. I know the area of the triangle. I know all these x's. I know, I know all these guys. The only thing I don't is a function of x is these guys here and y. So I can take the derivative of x and y fairly quick. Well, not that quick. Let the computer do it. <laughs> OK, so uh, I can calculate this now. Uh, I can now, let me call this whole thing B bold, okay? So I'll call this gradient of N bold B. 
bold, so then that becomes be bold transpose. Remember that we had an expression here in the previous page we, where we had gradient of n bold transpose. That now becomes b bold transpose. Okay, and so that's what we got, b bold transpose. Now it's three by two because I, I'm basically transposing this, so instead of two by three, I get three by two. D bold, don't remember, don't forget that D, I almost said don't remember, but I should tell you that you should remember that D bold equals to the conducti conductivity matrix, that's a measured quantity from testing, you can measure that, uh, so that's a two by two. Then I have a B bold here, that's just two by three, just like that. Uh, and that one, now I get a, how, how big of a size I get there? Three by three, that's correct. I should have three equations and three unknowns because it's a triangular element. Um, in, in, in bold is, is what? One by three. In transpose bold is three by one, so I get a three by three. That makes sense. And I can continue on and check the other ones as well. Okay. So now I'm ready. I know all these quantities. I know all of these except for the T bold and T bold dot. So now I'm ready to do uh, forward backward difference or if it's a steady problem, if it's steady state, T bold is zero, that's gone. You just solve it once and you're done, right? See how simple it is? But guess what, in real life, uh, that's true at steady state. But what if there's a more critical condition early in time, right? I just worked on a project, I've been, I've been working on a project where uh, I was looking for steady state for a long time and uh, I, I decided I should check uh, the transient events in between. I was working on a composite structure that's subject to these uh, thermal gradients. And when I'm looking at it, I find out, well, there's one time, at one point in time, things were actually worse than steady state. So steady state is not always a worst case scenario, okay? And our colleague in the back has worked on the reentry vehicles or some reentry applications or nozzle applications where the temperatures are very high and maybe the structure was originally cold well, you're going to have high thermal gradients that can cause a problem, potentially to the structure, okay? So um, that's what we need to cover on steady, so you know how to do that. And I believe you know how to do that now in Abacus, too. i give you examples on that. Uh, okay, any questions? Any questions? All right, so let me continue on here. Uh, that's for a triangular element, but what, for, what about a quadrilateral element? And by the way, for a triangular element, I want to make it clear that the number of steps required to solve these problems is quite long. I mean, if I make this your final exam, I think um, I think that So continuing on, let's look at the quadrilateral element. Quadrilateral element, uh, so I could have a 2D domain, and in a 2D domain I could have triangular elements and quadrilateral elements. And in this case, quadrilateral elements, how many nodes will I have if it's a linear quadrilateral element? One, two, three, and four, okay, excellent. So four elements, again, I have to keep the convention counterclockwise, make sure you have that clear. And now, since I have four nodal unknowns, how many unknown quantities I need to have? On four unknown coefficients. And so therefore, I need to have four terms in my approximation function. And that's what you see here. I've selected A plus BX plus CY plus DXY, where the ABCDs is what we need to find. And my shape function, what I'm really looking for is the shape functions N1, N2, N3, and N4. Uh, because they multiply, they're the ones that are the shape functions, the basis functions. And T1, T2, T3, T4 are the nodal unknown quantities, the quantities of interest. So now I have to relate A, B, C, D to N1, N2, sorry, to T1, T2, T3, T4. I can follow the same process, just follow that. Uh, but before I do that, I want to explain why I chose this approximation function, which is acceptable but did not choose something else. Maybe I could have selected plus dx squared plus dy squared. 
Well, the reason they didn't select plus dx squared because I'm biasing the solution in the x direction more than the y. That's not quite right. And on the second uh, example, I'm biasing the solution more to the y rather than, rather than to the x. So I need to be careful there. And for that reason, what makes more sense is to select x, y. So how to do that little, how to add more terms, but do it in a way that's more robust and, and careful? Uh, the way to do that is to use a Pascal triangle. Uh, so Pascal triangle basically you have one x y x y y squared and then x cubed x squared y x y squared y cubed then you can continue on so the next one will be x to the fourth and so forth and so for triangular element what you want to do is at least include three terms that makes total sense for a quadrilateral element instead of going kind of biased to the left and like that why not go right to the center and just select that one right here, okay, which is a bilinear uh, term. Okay? These terms are linear uh, terms. This one is a bilinear term. Okay, that, that one right there is a bilinear term. Uh, so it's, it's an order polynomial of n equals 2. Okay? Um, if I wanted to add more terms, I could. Okay? But I, I need to know how to add them in a careful manner. Okay? I'll cover that moving on in other lectures as we move forward. Um, so so this, this, this indeed is acceptable. Uh, I've done my homework to, to make sure I have the right number of terms in my approximation and that I'm not biasing the solution to the x squared or to the y squared. I'm selecting in a very careful manner. A, B, C, and D need to be found in terms of T1, T2, T3, T4, add, which are the nodal quantities uh, the nodes. And the other thing I want to point out is that uh, this x, y term here, remember we talked about I can represent constant stress state, uh, temperature states, remember that? And I can represent gradient, constant gradients. Well, I could have stopped here, right? Right? So uh, this is a surplus. This is an additional term that's a bonus term that I can add to it, uh, which is going to improve, it's only going to serve to improve my solution. Okay. Um, so again, I follow the same process to derive the shape functions. And Mathematica will do this for you, or MATLAB. Uh, but I'll say, uh, start with a plus bx plus cy plus dxy. And then I'll substitute x1 and y1 in here. And that will be the temperature at node 1. Then I'll go to node 2 and do the same. Put the coordinates for that node. And then that will be equal to t2 and so forth. So I have four equations. And then I have four unknowns. So I can put that in a matrix format, uh, in this format here. And now I can solve for A, B. So remember, all these quantities are known because I know the nodal locations. Uh, I know those coordinates, OK, a priori, before starting the final element solution. I know those coordinates. If I know that, I know this matrix fully. So now I can solve for A, B, and A, B, C, A, B, C, D. I can invert this matrix right here. And, and what I'll get uh, is uh, C bold, the, uh, you know, the inverse of that times temperature, nodal temperatures, OK? I can continue here, and uh, you can derive uh, the shape functions. Uh, this a uh, very nice technique, by the way. Uh, just remember, this was my approximation function. Is that true? And I found ABCD in terms of temperature. So I can plug in what ABCD is in, in a C bold inverse temperature. So C bold inverse of that times this polynomial here, that multiplication gives me the shape function straight out. Okay, so when you, when you perform that calculation. Uh, and so I have four shape functions now. Uh, and uh, now I'm ready to plug in this into my weak form, N bold, T bold. I won't write what this looks like in a very general way because it won't fit. Okay, uh, it won't fit here. It's a pretty extensive expression. But what we can do is look at a special case, like a rectangle. So instead of a quadrilateral in general, I can just look at the shape function for just a rectangle, which is what I've done here. So take a rectangle. Uh, say the rectangle has node 0, 0 at one corner. In real life, the quadrilateral is going to be somewhere, and it's not going to have 0, 0, right? And it's going to be in a very gener generic place, kind of like your homework, like your future homework. OK. Um, but you have 0, 0 there for node 1, node 2 
And then for node 3, that coordinate is L, W, and for node 4 is whatever it is there. L and W are known quantities. They're, they're just known for that quadrilateral. Uh, so these are your rectangular elements, and, and these are the shape functions that you get for that when you process everything. Uh, 10 points extra credit if you can get to these shape functions. Using the process I just showed you, uh, I think you can get to it very quick. All you have to do is follow the process at the top and you'll get to the bottom shape functions. Uh, so let's, let's examine these shape functions a little bit. Uh, can you see the mouse when I move it? Okay. Um, could you check with me if they can, the, the video over there, the monitor shows the mouse moving, just to make sure. Okay, so I'll, I'll be looking here at this shape function number one. Okay, shape function number one. Uh, you see, if I plug in x equals zero and y equals zero, what happens? I get one for this shape function here. What happens when I plug in x equals l or I plug in x equals? Sorry, I pl plug in x equals l. What happens? I get zero. So this shape function along the x equals l edge, so along this edge, is zero altogether. You see that? Can you also see that the shape function n1 is zero at the edge of y equals w? So at this edge, at this edge, and this edge, so these two edges basically, n1 does not contribute at all. It's almost absence. It's absent. Okay. For node two, for shape function two, the same can be said. So for shape function two, it's going to be active along this edge, these two edges, but it's not going to be active along this edge, three, four, and one, four. Now again, I will look at shape function four as, as an example. Let's do that one. So shape function four, uh, do, you, do you agree? Actually, let's do shape function three. I like that one, but it's easier. So at x equals L and y equals W, you agree that gives me 1. Can you now see that it doesn't matter what values of x or y I give it, that e e either of those two are 0, and basically I have 0. Yeah? So you can see clearly now that shape function 3, which belongs to this node here, that that shape function is 0 at 4, at 1, and 2. Yeah? Because x is 0, you know? at this edge, and then y is zero at this edge. So these two, these three nodes, that shape function three is zero. It's only active along this edge, okay, along these two edges. Any questions on that? Do you think I'll satisfy Kronecker delta property here? Absolutely. Will, will you agree that I'll get partition, partition unity to work out? is going to work, it will give you one for sure when you add them up. Uh, I did that, okay? I didn't show you the work, but I did it 15 years ago. Don't have to do it again. Uh, you have to do it again. You have to do everything again, okay? All right, so now I plug in my approximation function into the weak form, and when I do that, uh, now I have uh, the, um, uh, this is the same as before, but now I have four terms for the shape functions. And the gradient of n, bold, is basically uh, these derivatives, okay? All right? Any questions on that? It's the same as before, but now the size of this matrix is 2 by 4, okay? And uh, now B bold transpose is 4 by 2. This is 2 by 2. That's 2 by 4. And uh, you can check the rest of it, but you'll get four equations for unknowns. Okay. That is the end of uh, 2D element formulation global coordinate systems. Okay. And what I want to show you is that for a partial differential equation, in a more general sense, okay, a partial differential equation in a very general sense.
can be used to solve any problem that you will like. I focus on a heat transfer problem. Is that true? I can apply it to eight other problems, seven other problems, using this partial differential equation. Uh, and all is going to change is the, the meaning of AXX and AYY. You know? But when you go through this, you will be able to specify it for your problem and solve it for that particular problem. Uh, for example, in heat transfer problem, the temperature of interest, U will become T in this equation. Okay? Uh, F, in this case right there, is a heat generation, which adds as Q. Right? Here they're using F, but we use Q instead, Q, Q uh, capital letter Q. Um, for AXX and AYY, we're going to select the thermal conductances, KXX and KYY. And the heat flux is QN. Remember that small QN at the boundary? That's that guy right here. And so that is for a heat transfer problem. And I can now, if I know, do you agree that if I know how to do a heat transfer problem now, I can now solve any of these other problems? So for example, uh, I can look at a flow through a porous medium. So for that problem, uh, you have the fluid head, the potential phi. Okay, so instead of U, I have phi in there. I can put phi in there. Uh, I will have now the permeability of that porous medium. Okay, I can measure that permeability. And I can use that uh, instead of AXX and AYY, I will select mu XX and mu YY. Okay, and uh, I can continue forward here and look at torsional problems where I have a torsion of cylindrical member. Okay. In that case, I have a stress function C, okay, and then instead of U, I have C. In this case, actually, uh, the, the AXX and AYY is kind of cool. They're just one, okay, value of one there. And then uh, now you have this uh, F, which is selected as 2G theta, uh, and finally the variable of interest that there is your boundary conditions for a torsional problem, okay. Uh, you may have covered in a previous class or a more advanced class area stress function. Okay, so, so you can actually solve area stress function problems uh, using this equation, right? Uh, but using finite elements now. Uh, now I have a deflection of a membrane, and I can also solve a flow of inviscid flows. So I can look at a flow of uh, inviscid flow. Uh, I have velocity potential, phi, and then I will have uh, AXX and AYY will become one. Uh, you can also look at it in terms of stream of the function, okay, C, okay, and then you can also use that. You can also solve electrostatic problems. Electrostatic problems where the electrical potential phi is used as a primary variable of interest, and now you have a dielectric constant epsilon, uh, and then you have a charge density. So the, the, the electric constant epsilon typically factors out, it's constant. Uh, and then you have the charge density rho uh, here, which will become uh, basically your F in this equation. And then you have the electric flux at the boundary. Okay. You can see here very quickly that uh, I can solve uh, a large number of problems in, in structural mechanics, and that I'm, I'm able to to extend this, you know, not only I can solve heat transfer problem, I can solve seven other problems, and and I'm not even showing them all. I I can solve even more problems than the one shown here. I'm just showing you just uh, uh, just a subset of that. Okay. So with that said, I think I'm going to uh, conclude today's lecture, um, but I want to prepare you for next Thursday. Uh, what we're doing for, and I'm not done today yet. We're going to take about uh, a five minute break and then we're going to have another presentation by a colleague here. Okay, I'm looking at you. And then after that we're going to have another presentation uh, by a violinist. He's going to come here. He's going to talk about frequency. Uh, so I want to discuss a little bit more about frequencies. Uh, uh, and then I'm hoping that um, next week we'll have another lecture by a student here that works in industry. He's going to apply a concept to a wing, you know, some of the concepts to wings. Okay. 
So let's talk about a uh, little bit about what's coming up on Thursday because I, I kind of, your heart is beating pretty fast. I told you, you your final exam is going to have a triangle and then quadrilaterals and, and things like that. But what I haven't told you is that there's a better way. There's a better way and that better way, just imagine if I gave you a final exam where I gave you 10 elements and all 10 elements have different coordinates, have different area. You have to calculate the shape functions. You have to calculate the gradients of the shape functions. You have to calculate the integrals of what the weak form. You have to do all of that for every single element. But that is not the better way. There's a better way, and that way is using isoparametric formulation. What if I can take every triangle that looks a different shape and make it look all the same? All the triangles will have the same shape. What if quadrilateral elements that have, all of them have different shapes, um, and I didn't even show you what the shape functions look for those because then I think you'll pass out if I tell you that's the final exam. <laughs> but what if I told you that shape functions for all those quadrilaterals, that it will look very complex if you did it in Mathematica, and I, I do encourage you to do it in Mathematica. I can turn all of them into a square. And now I can solve the weak form lurking for that square. And if I solve the weak form lurking for the square, I can now solve the global system of equations without having to deal with deriving shape functions and the, and the derivatives. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? OK. So with that said, um, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, I thought it would be great, uh, you know, one of the uh, colleagues here has done a great job with coding up uh, how to do the assembly process and I thought we'll give him the opportunity to discuss how he did it. There's many others here that are very capable of doing it but I just selected this student because uh, I wanted somebody to discuss it. That's the first thing we'll be doing. The second thing is a question came up when I was discussing dynamics and, and it was here. You asked me and, and you asked me what is the meaning of frequency? When I'm getting these frequencies and I have 50 hertz, I'm getting 50 hertz. What is, what is the meaning of that? And uh, I think it's important to understand that concept a little bit more. But I'll tell you this. If I have a mass and I have a spring, and then that spring is, is affixed on one end, and I, I, I put a little load so it will start vibrating naturally, uh, what we're talking about here is that that frequency is the number of cycles per second, that mass is oscillating, okay? That's what we're talking about. In that case, for a sim simple mass with a spring that's a fixed, the, the, the frequency, frequency can be find, uh, found as omega squared uh, equals square root of k over m. You can find that frequency for simple problem. Um, the problems you're looking at uh, are a little bit more complex, and so, what we're going to do is we'll talk to musician, right? Because musicians know more than I do about dynamics, I think. They, first of all, they know how to play music, which I don't, <laughs> okay? Uh, but I also want to discuss that frequency is also an acoustic problem. And so your hearing, right now you have a hearing, that hearing that you have can hear certain frequencies, okay? So if that mass was oscillating, at a frequency that you can hear, okay, say so it was oscillating, and, and he's going to speak about it, but I'm just giving you a heads up. Uh, you'll, you'll hear that mass oscillate because it's oscillating at the same frequency as what you can hear. Okay, you follow me? Okay, and that's where music comes from, and he will do a better job than I can, so I'll leave it up to him. With that said, give me about, give me about five minutes to set up the presentation that we're going to get. And uh, in the meanwhile, um, please take a break, and, you, and, and, and we'll talk to you in a few minutes, okay? So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to uh, quickly go over uh, assembling process for uh, global stiffness. It can be either uh, the stiffness matrix or the mass matrix. So basically, uh, I'm going to uh, walk uh, through uh, the assembling process and uh, basically prepare you guys to read the final code. So let's start from here. This is a bar problem from lecture 14. 
Uh, it has a stiffness matrix for two elements, uh, I identical stiffness matrix, K1, K2. <coughs> so first of all, uh, we need to uh, determine the size of the global stiffness matrix. So we do uh, that by counting the nodes and number of unknowns at each node. So here we have three nodes, and uh, in each node we have one unknown. It's uh, ax axial deflection in a bar, so it's three, the size of global matrix. So at the beginning, uh, we, can, uh, sta uh, we can make a, a zero matrix in the size of a global stiffness matrix in our code. Then as we go, we fill out this matrix using uh, the uh, individual uh, stiffness matrix for each element. <coughs> so starting from uh, this point, uh, I will uh, uh, start from the element 1, 1 in a global <coughs> uh, stiffness matrix. So uh, for 1, 1, I will uh, call uh, all the uh, components in the individual stiffness that have code 1, 1. So for element 1, we have 1, 1, and the value is 1. I will bring inside the stiffness matrix the global one. For the other element, there is no 1, 1 code. So I'll move uh, to the next component in a global stiffness matrix, row 1, uh, column 2. For row 1, column 2, code is 1, 2. <coughs> so 1, 2. Uh, I have a 1, 2 in element 1. So I move it uh, to uh, that location in global stiffness matrix. But there is no 1, 2 for the uh, element 2. So I will uh, move to the next uh, position in the global stiffness matrix. Next position is uh, row 1, column 3. Row 1, column 3 code is 1, 3. 1, 3 does not exist in neither of the elements. So it will stay 0. And after doing so, I'm in the second row in the global stiffness matrix. Second row, column 1. So the code is 2, 1. 2, 1 exists in uh, stiffness matrix for element 1. I call that and bring it here. For this one, it doesn't exist. Then I'll move on. So here is a 2, 2. Row 2, column 2. Row 2, column 2, code is 2, 2. Uh, I'm calling uh, the value of 2, 2 from here and value of 2, 2 here and adding it up. And then we continue this till we fill out uh, the stiffness matrix. Now I'm going to go to the, so this is the stiffness matrix that we get. Now uh, going to the code, I'm going to show you what is uh, the part that we need to focus more to get the right solution. So here, let's say uh, if I'm uh, re uh, reading, if I need to get the components here, row 2 and column 3 for the stiffness matrix. <coughs> code is 2, 3. 2, 3 exists only in uh, element 2, 2, 3. But when I want to go to the element 2, and from that matrix, I'm calling the component 2, 3, the code will give me an error, because that is a 2 by 2 matrix, and there is no such thing like 2, 3. So in order to. Uh, get this thing working, we need to remap the solution. So here, uh, I, I start with the number of elements, number of nodes, number of unknowns. This is uh, the stiffness matrix for each element. And this is the code number for each element. Then I'm putting the code numbers in an array and the stiffness matrix in another array. <coughs> then this is the size of the global matrix. And I'm making a zero matrix. Uh, here, I'm starting counting the elements. If you remember, uh, when we start with the global stiffness matrix, uh, I started from this cell and I, the way I went all the way. I did my check on each element. So I'm going to loop over all the elements from one to the last element. I'm storing the stiffness matrix of that element in K, code of that element in code, and then this is the <coughs> i that goes on the row of stiffness matrix. And here it says if this i, let's say row 1, code is 1. If code 1 uh, is a member of code, and the code is code number for element 1. So if row 1 is a member of code, which is, so we're going to go to the next one, the next loop. Then for that one, I need to go to all the columns. 
for uh, <coughs> columns, I'm going to count it with J. And let's say for J, I can have J, 1, 2, 3. Then I'm going to again check if J exists in the code for that element. If they both exist, that means that I have this code in that element. So now I need to move the value to the global stiffness matrix and add it to the initial value. But remember, so for this uh, component here, for this uh, position, uh, the i is 2, j is 3. But if I'm simply calling the value of k, which is k element 1, if I'm simply calling i2 and j3, uh, I'm going to get an error because there is no component with 2, 3. So I need to remap. Uh, here I'm saying that go and find what is the position of 1, what is the posi position of this in the code. So i is 2 here. So if I go to the code, code is the element 1. So position of 2 is 2 here. And j is, oh, it's here, element 2. So position of 2 is 1 here. And j was 3. So if I'm going to the code, and code refers to element 2, j3, the position is 2 there. So basically, I'm going to call 1, 2. And that's 1, 2 in element 2. So basically, you remap. We store the code for element 2 as 2, 3. But if we remap, we know that 2 refers to position 1, 3 refers to position 2. And I'm, I read that by this guy and say, find where 2 is located. So 2 is located at position 1, and 3 is located at position 2 in my code. <laughs> Maybe uh, you will say you could do this simply by uh, subtracting i and j by 1. But that's only going to work for bar. Because for beam, when you have two unknown at each node, then maybe you need to subtract by two. And if you have more unknown at each node, you need to subtract by that number. But if you just remap and find the position where your code is, position one, position two, and then call that component in that statistics matrix with that position, then you will be able to <coughs> recall this element, this component, and bring it here. So you can use this. And if you use this, I tried it uh, in uh, different codes and <coughs> homeworks, and it works. So this is a 24-element <coughs> uh, 2D truss. Uh, so the stiffness matrix is uh, because uh, there is a 24-element, 24-element. Uh, so this is 28 by 28, the stiffness matrix. And uh, when I compared uh, with uh, Abacus, uh, the displacement, uh, reaction forces, and the stresses, everything was the same with Abacus. So I can see that the stiffness matrix that I assembled is the same as it should be. So if I now go to, oh, and one more thing in this code. In this code, uh, you see here, uh, you might wonder, what is this thing? Uh, if you open that, uh, it says uh, you might use another keyword that it's going to speed up your code. But uh, it's uh, already, uh, I mean, it's already fast. We don't need to speed up. So let's say if I'm running this code for uh, 24 element truss, as soon as I run, I'm done. And I'm getting all the displacement, which is 28 displacement. And uh, stresses sigma and the reaction forces. So code is pretty fast. I mean, even though it says you can improve it, but for this uh, range of work, it's still working well. And this is the element that I had the MATLAB code for. Basically, uh, is a, a 24 element truss. I applied, a, a, I applied a, a skew boundary condition here, here, a fixed boundary condition here, and I applied displacement, negative 1 here, and a load here, and a load, I believe, here. So you can apply any number of elements, any 
condition for your loading, even if you apply, you can apply the displacement and everything matches exactly the same as Abacus. So it's kind of cool to see the code match with Abacus with that range of number of unknowns. <coughs> That's all. Is that going? All right, cool. Well, my name is Warren. Uh, I'm a graduate student here in the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department. Switch careers to music. I'm just kidding now. Um, but I'm here to demonstrate the vibrating string problem that I think you guys have been studying, at least uh, your TA, Leonardo, told me about. And so I have here my instrument, a violin, which is just four strings strung across the bridge, which is this little piece of cork, I think it is right here, to the peg box over here. And each of these strings are tensioned to a certain amount so that each string when you're looking from this side on the right is tuned so it vibrates at a natural frequency that's 1.5 times higher than the string to its left. And to change the pitch, I can either tune it, but this is already in decent tune, I think, so I'm not going to retune it. But uh, to change the pitch that you're playing or to change the frequency, you can plant down your finger at specific locations and you'll sound a different note or you'll, you'll increase the frequency by decreasing the length here. I think uh, what Leonardo wants me to demonstrate is different mode shapes. So if you can consider uh, the first mode, either with an initial displacement condition by plucking it, or with the forcing function by bowing, you can change the mode shape by planting your finger down. And the halfway point will sound one octave higher in musical terms, or double the frequency in mathematical terms. And so you can also uh, kick it up to the fourth mode, like that. And that forces uh, two sine waves in here instead of one there or half there. So that's pretty much. Can you give us uh, some number? Frequency? Yeah, so this, this note is A. It's tuned to sound at 440 hertz generally. So when I plant my finger up here, cutting the length in half, it doubles the frequency to 880. And then if this is 440, the next string up E is one and a half times that, so that's 660. So this is double 660. And that's about it. And, and, and what is the range that we can hear frequencies? It's like 20 to 20,000 hertz, I think. I, I didn't look that up, but it's pretty high. And so you can go all the way up to like, or even, and you can still hear those notes. But then past a certain point, it just sounds really bad, or you won't hear it at all. <laughs> all right. All righty. Thank you very much. No problem.